Lesson 22. Self-honesty, the greatest act of love. Beloved and holy friends, we come forth but with one purpose, to join with the mind of the Holy Son of God, for surely this is what you are. We come forth to join with the mind that was there in the beginning, before the mountains and seas arose, before the universe arose, before even the thought of space and time arose. We come forth then to join with that mind of the Holy Son of God that has remained in perfect union as the Sonship, in perfect union with its Creator, in perfect union with reality and with love. Though we have said it unto you many times, we ask you to truly take pause and to consider this one statement. We come forth to join with you, not from a place above you or beyond you, but a place in which you already dwell eternally. No perception, no appearance can change the truth that is true always, even in this moment as you read these words. Can you feel and accept the truth of them? The only reason you can understand them, the only reason you can sense the truth that comes through them, is because you are that truth, and you know that truth. There is a place within you that is unbounded, eternal, invisible, incomprehensible to the world mind, incomprehensible to the sense of the body, but perfectly and even simply comprehensible to the silence in which the soul dwells, comprehensible in a state of perfect knowledge, all teaching regardless of the form, and there are many forms of the universal curriculum, has but one specific goal, to nudge the mind of the dreamer beyond his or her dream, to return that mind to a state of perfect knowledge. Some would call it enlightenment, that which suddenly is flooded with light. Light is truth, and truth is knowledge, and knowledge is love. Therefore, when we come forth to join with you, the only purpose that we have is to enlighten you, to turn your awareness, your attention to that you already know. The only difference between knowledge and belief, which is the same as the difference between love and fear, is that in the state of knowledge or enlightenment, the resistance to the truth vanishes. Initially, perhaps, for just a moment, but eventually, there is no longer any resistance to the simplicity of the truth. This transformation from a state of fear to love, or from ignorance, the ignoring of truth, to enlightenment, the embracing and acknowledging of truth, occurs for each mind within the dream in a very specific way. That is, it must occur according to what is required to release the patterns that have settled into that particular mind. In a general way, those patterns are the same for everyone, but in their expression they take on a perfect uniqueness. Therefore the timing of your enlightenment, the timing of your healing, the way in which it occurs, and the contexts that are necessary for you to be challenged by your own self will be uniquely your own. Why? So that the belief you have been holding, born out of fear, can be brought to the attention and then released. This is the way in the way of transformation. It is absolutely essential that you never compare your journey to another's. By all means, pay attention to the journeys of your brothers and sisters. Be open at all times to learn, to grow, to assimilate, to apply, to integrate, to consider and to ponder without comparing. The ego always compares and contrasts. It looks upon itself. It takes itself picture and compares it to a picture of another mind, without even noticing that the picture is something it has created. It believes that it has seen what is outside of itself, that the picture or the analysis of another actually exists in that other, and it may. The point here is that the ego compares and contrasts, and then draws a conclusion about its own worthiness, its own progress, its own state of illumination. All of this must be ego function, because in reality, you are as you are created to be. And wherever you are in any given moment, enlightenment is but a decision away. That decision entails but one thing, to release the insane valuation that you have placed upon everything and everyone, most especially yourself. That decision rests on the willingness to take God at God's word. That decision rests on your willingness to cultivate silence. Inner silence, the threshold to wisdom divine. The theme, then, of this lesson is the cultivation of the inner silence, which is the threshold to wisdom divine. How, then, does a mind come to true silence? It is not merely a matter of closing the mouth. It is not simply a matter of shutting out the noise of the world. It is certainly not a matter of ceasing to listen to others, whether they speak the word of praise or words of criticism. Quite to the contrary. Silence can be cultivated in a number of ways. Initially, it will look like something you do through the body, to breathe deeply and rhythmically, to sit next to an ocean, to sit beneath a tree, and become absorbed in the wind. Or to merely practice the ancient art of remaining silent without speaking as you go through your daily events. All of these begin to cultivate a relaxation within the brain, the nervous system, and the body. Yet these things are merely projections of mind anyway. 
So to still the body, to calm the body, to allow the activity in the brain hemispheres to relax and become more harmonious is in fact an initial step in bringing the mind to silence. But far deeper than these things is this, that genuine silence which is, indeed, the threshold of wisdom, and wisdom is nothing more than enlightenment, requires the cultivation of deep self-honesty. Honesty is that act in which the mind is no longer committed to hiding from its own darkness. I have said many times and in many ways that it is necessary to enter into the blackness of the ego in order to discover what you are no longer. In truth, for anyone who makes such a journey, that which the ego is becomes repulsive, repugnant, and hurtful to oneself, and that is the only thing that matters. Therefore, understand that in the way of transformation, although we have covered such territory in these lessons so far, a cornerstone of the universal curriculum must always be the cultivation of a deep self-honesty. In self-honesty, one decides to simply observe the mind itself, to simply observe the behavior that flows from the mind through the body as it gestures itself out into the world. True self-honesty requires time. Why? Because the ego is the attempt to replace honesty and truth with dishonesty and falsity. Imagine for a moment that you are fully enlightened in this moment. You are abiding in a state of perfect freedom and peace. You are at one with God. Would there be anything that you would need to be dishonest with in your own mind? What corner of the mind would you have failed to embrace in light? Therefore, in truth, beloved friends, understand well that the ego is the attempt to replace honesty with dishonesty. It is dishonesty itself. In fact, one could go so far to say that those that would seek for the devil need look only at the ego, in which case the ego becomes egocentric. Your sense of identity is all wrapped up in defending and protecting a false image of yourself. Much resistance is pervading your human domain, which is only this. No, I will not look honestly. I must uphold the image I need to believe is true about myself. This is not love, and this is not truth. An Exercise in Self-Honesty Beloved friends, take a moment and simply cultivate deep self-honesty by merely answering these questions. Have I ever had a murderous thought? Have I ever manipulated another mind in order to try to gain what I believed I needed? Have I ever withdrawn love for the subtle reason of causing hurt or trying to cause hurt to another? Have I ever had disrespectful sexual fantasies? Have I ever hated the world? Have I ever despised myself? And last, but surely not last, for in truth, if you would consider it, all of these questions emanate out of this one. Have I ever hated God? In perfect self-honesty, the answer to each of these questions can only be yes. The honest mind looks upon all that has arisen with it without judgment, for there can be no honesty while there is judgment. Think well upon the questions that we have asked you, then simply take it a step further and ask yourself, has any of that type of thing occurred within my mind recently? Notice what happens now. Pay attention to your mind and even to your body and breath. What occurs as you begin to get closer to the truth? Do you notice a little bit of restlessness, the mind becoming more active with chatter? Decide for silence. Decide for peace. For healing occurs to the depth and degree that the mind is willing to embrace what occurs within it. Denial causes separation, self from self, self from others, and self from God. Therefore, the very peace that the mind seeks through religious belief is impossible, as long as the mind is in denial about itself. Rest assured, when I walked upon your planet as a man, I too often became quite frustrated at the Pharisees who would stand in the corner in their long, beautiful robes, professing religious belief. They had their just reward. This is why I often said, Beware of those who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. For this honest mind is in conflict constantly. It splits itself off from its sexuality as a human being. It splits itself off from its anger, its sadness, its hurt, and its murderous thought. But the mind that is healed has learned to turn and embrace every subtle shadow within the mind, for love alone embraces all things, trusts all things, allows all things, and thereby transcends all things, and needs no longer live in fear that those things can run it. Enlightenment is a state in which the world, and the world is not outside of you, the world in this context, the thoughts, images, and perceptions that you have attracted to yourself, can no longer hold power over you. It does not mean that it ceases to exist. This has been the great error of religion as opposed to spirituality. Religion will give you a set of beliefs, ideas about yourself, standards that you must achieve. Thereby, the mind concludes, If I am to be a spiritual person, I cannot be angry. If I am a spiritual person, I don't have sexual fantasies about my neighbor. All of that is absolutely false. 
For in reality, the experience in your domain is one in which the mind is created and is aware of all things unlike love. It then splits itself off and projects an image called the ego, to itself first and obviously to others, that it most wants to believe is true. But remember, belief is not knowledge. Knowledge alone allows the mind to observe what arises within it without judgment, without fear, without identifying with it. It looks upon the world in perfect forgiveness and says, I just had a murderous thought. I had a picture of hitting my employer over the head with a sledgehammer and watching the blood spurt through the broken skull. Ah, uh, yes, well, just another thought arising and passing away in this domain. It does not change the truth of who I am, and I am free to extend love or to hit him with a hammer. The mind that is free and at peace is no longer conflicted within itself. The mind that is unconflicted abides in perfect vulnerability. It has learned to embrace and accept the truth about the phenomena of the mind itself in this dream world. It is willing to begin to be honest and to cultivate deeper honesty with everyone around him. No longer is there pretense. No longer is there manipulation or control. There is no unconscious, split-off energy actually running the show, even though the mind seems to be oblivious to it. The mind in conflict with itself is dangerous to itself, and of course, by extension, to everyone else in all dimensions. Therefore, indeed, beloved friends, beware of those that come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Beware of the viciousness of the ego within your own mind. How does it come to you in sheep's clothing? Does it minimize hurtful behavior? Does it minimize what is truly merely a lack of self-responsibility? Does it always make excuses why your life is not progressing in a way of becoming more and more empowered to bring forth Christ? Learn to cultivate self-honesty. Though it sounds like a simple thing, this does take time, simply because the mind has used its own power to be in denial about its own miscreation. It does not want to own them. It does not want to embrace them. It wants very much for you and itself to believe that it is really a very high spiritual being. It will wear the sheep's clothing of the ego, or the persona, the mask, the self-image, the projected image into the social world, and it will cling to that like a robe around the body, held against the cold winter wind, and it will cling to it no matter what. Such a mind is an insane mind, and an insane mind is hurtful. An insane mind limits the flow of love through that it could heal this world. Therefore, beloved friends, as we move toward the close of the way of transformation, we again bring the arrow back to a point of ourselves, to point at the depth of the mind and learn to observe it. Take the list of questions that we have offered unto you and simply repeat that process on a daily basis. So you see, we first begin in the safety of allowing you to look way, way into the past to see if any of those has ever been going on in your mind. Now we come closer and closer to the self-honesty of what is occurring in the mind right here and right now so that each day you ask the same questions and see what the answer is. In this way, the mind will become more and more transparent. You will learn to look upon your murderous thoughts and all of those hideous, unspiritual things that you have tried to shove down into the basement. More and more as you tell yourself the truth about them, and more and more as you find a friend or two willing to tell the truth about their own minds with you, the more the mind becomes transparent, the less and less you have any need to hide. A mind no longer committed to hiding becomes transparent to itself, and through it the power of Christ can begin to move with certainty, with knowledge, with grace, and with compassion. The mind has always been the problem, but not the entirety of the mind, just a small corner that has been fenced off called the ego. When you become identified with only that part of the mind, you become egocentric. The center of your identity became the ego, and that is the source of your problem. Quite frankly, it is like identifying with a pimple on the skin and then defending the pus within at all cost. Silence is the doorway that will dissolve that pimple and that pus forever. Silence is arrived at in many ways, but the principal cornerstone is deep self-honesty. The act of transformation, then, the way of transformation, is a process whereby you put the squeeze on the pimple of the ego, and you no longer care what pus comes out because you can just be done with it. Self-honesty is the greatest act of love that you will ever experience within yourself, greater than any sexual union, greater than any adulation of the world, and greater than any mystical experience. The embracing of deep self-honesty, the mastery of it, is the greatest act of love that the mind can experience. For in perfect self-honesty the world is transcended, fear is dissolved, and enlightenment is present. And in enlightenment there is remembrance of perfect innocence in union with God. Therefore, indeed, beloved friends, you who want in truth to come to know Christ, look not outside yourself, for the kingdom is within. 
The mind is your domain, and the mind is yourself. It has certain components, such as an emotional component or expression, an egoic component or expression. The ego in itself is not right, wrong, bad, or good. It simply is. The mistake, the knot in the rope, the blip on the screen is merely the mistaken identification of yourself with the ego. That is what creates a tension, a twisting of the rope that ends up distorting everything. You end up being in judgment of yourself because you had a sexual thought yesterday. Heaven forbid. You judge yourself because you feel a little angry. You judge yourself because a thought goes through the mind. What's the point in being on this planet? As long as you are identifying with those thoughts, you are in trouble. But when you see them as just an innocent flow, a temporary movement of energy through a vast domain called the mind, then you know that you are free. You begin to taste the spaciousness of the silence that always is around the edges of everything that arises in the mind. You begin to become identified with that spaciousness, with that peace, and there wisdom returns gently. You begin again to remember that you were created to create, and creation is extension, not projection. Extension is that which floods or extends outward the good, the holy, and the beautiful. You no longer make justifications for not taking action to extend compassion to other minds in the world, but rather you begin to wrap yourself around this world, around this planet, even around the universe, and you proclaim and know in the depth of your being that you are the Holy Son of God, and you will not settle for less than heaven on earth. No longer do the problems seem as large or complex because you abide in the state of truth and knowledge that is bigger than the world. For you know that through you, God can do anything, if only you will direct your attention, open up the floodgates, and allow it to happen. You begin to step into the greatest place of power that there is. This is truly what was meant in even your Christian religion, that Christ returned to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. The one who sits at the right hand is the chief of staff, the one who makes it all happen. To sit at the right hand of God is to allow your mind to abide in right-mindedness. And in right-mindedness, you see no separation between yourself, your brothers, and your sisters, which means you see no separation between yourself and the world. Getting to heaven is no longer an attraction. Bringing heaven to this world is. Bringing light to darkness is all that matters. Constantly desiring to bring greater light to your own darkness is the way in which you live, moment to moment, desiring greater light, greater light, and greater light. What do I need to let go of? How deep can my self-honesty go? How wide can my compassion for life spread? What actions am I actually taking in this world? What am I defending? What am I afraid of? Am I willing to become so powerful a conduit for Christ that I take on a responsibility for the atonement and tell Jeshua to move aside? For the mind in right-mindedness serves only the voice for God. It no longer has any interest in defending the voice of egocentricity. Therefore, beloved friends, for the next 30 days, practice self-honesty. Utilize the questions we have given you each day. Also, merely sit down with a pad of paper and a pen and ask, What thoughts have gone through my mind this day? If you want, you can draw a line through the paper down the center, and on one side put loving thoughts, and on the other side unloving thoughts. Remember, those are just your own judgments, and see what comes up. In truth and reality, in the physical domain and dimension, no one is without unloving thoughts. Why? Because the mind is a vast space through which thoughts like radio waves are passing constantly, quite frankly, and we have spoken to you on this before, in the end, you do not really know who is doing the thinking. You are only aware of a thought arising in the mind. The ego says, I am this, I am that, this thought must be mine, that thought must be yours. In truth, you are all swimming in the same sea, and there is merely thoughts arising and passing away. You do have the power to discern and select which thoughts will hold value for you, but it is impossible to push away what you have decided to judge as unspiritual thoughts. Can you imagine becoming so free that when a murderous thought arises, it makes you laugh and you tell the truth? Ah, oh, when you reached across the table and you ate the potato chip off my plate, I saw an image of taking a huge axe and cutting off your hand and making you eat your own fingers. Ha, huh, what a thought! For it is the embrace with perfect self-honesty that returns the mind to sanity. It is a refusal, to be honest, that creates the conflict and tension in the mind that is called insanity. And insanity is a state in which the mind is not at peace, and Christ cannot enter therein. Many of you have come from a tradition that you call Catholicism. Within it there is a practice called confession. This is really the idea of that practice, although, of course, it has been used to place guilt. That is not the point. Confession means to be willing to be honest. 
The priest was meant to be a representation, a symbol of God or Christ's mind, so that you could sit in your little box, which is really a symbol of going into your own internal privacy and telling the truth to your higher self, to the self that loves you anyway, to the mind of God that embraces all things and transcends all things. Now, in truth, the mind will not tell you that you must say 947,000 Hail Marys and sweep the streets of the city. It will merely say, Beloved child, you are forgiven already. For you have returned to sanity by merely confessing to the deepest part of yourself what has arisen and passed away within the lower mind, the mind associated with the body in the field of temporality. It is just like going to the depth of the ocean into the silence thereof and saying, Yes, I was just out there on the tip of the foam of the wave and was part of the lot of chaos out there. How about that? And the ocean remains as it has always been. Lack of honesty in self leads to lack of honesty in relationship, and lack of honesty in relationship creates a tension and appearance of separation and guilt, which is the very nemesis that the soul is seeking to overcome. Self-honesty, then, the return to perfect peace, requires in the end the cultivation of a vulnerability. For in my perfect vulnerability I find my perfect safety. The vulnerable are the meek, those who have returned to their own innocence and know that the opinions and judgments of others cannot harm them. They live merely honest with themselves, without pretense, without image, no longer concerned with that world, the insane world. They become more and more a conduit through which the power and love of God begins to work, and through them other minds are reached. Unbeknownst to them, they become a living, walking, as long as the body lasts, conduit through which grace is transformed to other minds, and in the presence of such a one, other minds heal spontaneously. Other minds are attached to such a being, not because they are doing anything, not because they perceive themselves as great, but because they know that only God is great. There is no longer a self that they are trying to defend. Everything becomes merely a context in which it can be used by the Holy Spirit to bring about the atonement. They walk in the world, unknown by the world, unseen by the world. They seem very ordinary. They merely do as love asks them to do. You are birthing Christ. Nothing can prevent it from occurring now. Merely trust each moment. Surrender into each moment. Embrace your commitment to reality. Teach only love to yourself by loving that which you have hated and judged, by allowing yourself to feel and to know that which is passing through the mind and body anyway. Embrace it. See your ordinary humanness, not as an obstruction to peace, but as that through which peace can be extended. Beloved friend, there is a great depth and treasure awaiting you if you will put the message of this lesson into practice with passion, even zealousness, and with full commitment to your own Christedness, to see that you are worthy of the deepest honesty that you can reach, that you can confess, that you can live. For ultimately, the deepest honest truth is, I and my Father are one. I am Christ eternal. Beloved friends, be you therefore at peace this day. Have fun with the exercise we have given you, and know how much you are loved. Amen.